my father was looking for better living conditions and we had relatives in the city and they were constantly writing about the opportunities and and sometime in late 23 my father left Mississippi and came to Chicago he was employed by the corn products refining company in Argo Illinois my family was kind of late leaving but uh, on my on my uh, mother's side my aunt had come to Chicago my aunt Mamie the oldest sister and so uh, some other relatives and uh, they were the ones that were urging my mother and dad to leave the south and come to illinois come to chicago well they were looking almost as the jews were looking for the promised land uh, chicago was a land of promise and they they thought that milk and honey was everywhere and so it was a lot of excitement leaving the south leaving the cotton fields uh leaving the uh place where you had to get off the sidewalk if you as you approached a white woman particularly and holding your head down you could hold your head up in chicago so this was very very exciting I suppose you would say that. In fact, uh, I have learned in these latter years that uh, my son was thought of as the rich kid. And, uh, well, I thought we lived a very ordinary life. I was one of, I was the second black person in Argo, Illinois, to get off my knees and start working for the federal government. I had worked with the Coffee School of Aeronautics for about two years, and that's where a lot of the Tuskegee Airmen first became pilots. And during the war, they were they became known as the Tuskegee, whatever I can't remember their exact title. But I worked with those fellows out at 87th and Harlem before there was even transportation there. There were no roads leading to uh to 87th in Harlem and uh I remember they would pick me up every morning at 87th street and we would bump 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 until we got to the airport they would pick me up at 63rd in Harlem and uh we just picked our way out to 87th in Harlem uh that gave me that I was looked upon with a lot of respect because I was no longer cleaning houses and babysitting and washing and ironing. And believe me, uh, my wages were about $7 a week, but I earned every, every cent of it. Uh, I had the big house to clean up. I had the children to babysit and to feed and to bathe and to play with. I had the washing to do, the ironing to do. I, the responsibility of the entire family was mine. And I must say that I did a remarkable job. I was a very thorough little housekeeper. My move to government work was very historic because uh, no, none of the black people were able to take the civil service exam. It wasn't even open to us. But my best girlfriend, Ollie Williams, uh, I had gotten her a job with the Coffee School of Aeronautics and we would ride together every morning. In fact, she would have breakfast at my house in Argo and then we would, uh, my mother would take us to 63rd in Harlem and the bus would pick us to go to 87th in Harlem. And, uh, Two mornings she didn't show, and I couldn't understand what had happened to Ollie. I called her, and uh, somebody told me that Ollie was at work. I said, no, she didn't come to work yesterday or today. Uh, and they told me, oh, she has a civil service job. Oh, uh, who? Okay, so 
when I got a chance to speak with Ali, I wanted to know what is going on and why didn't you tell me? And uh, uh, I don't know, she really never gave me a satisfactory explanation. But uh, I told her, so will you tell me where you get, where you take that exam? And she was a little hedgy about telling me, but I got it out of her. And uh, I told my mother where I wanted to go. I went back to my job and I told the owners, there was Cornelius Coffee was the uh, head of everything. And his wife, Willa Brown Coffee, who was an aviatrix, she really ran the show. She ran him and everything else. And uh, I asked for a raise. And she told me, she said, well, I have to tell you, wages are frozen. And when she told me that, it kind of galvanized something within me. And I asked for a day off. And uh, I told him I wouldn't be in tomorrow, whatever day that was. And uh, so the next morning, I told my mother, we're going to social, we're going and uh, take the civil service exam. And mom would usually try to grant my wishes. And we went. I have no idea where it was. But we went in. And I took that exam, I went through the written and the oral with flying colors. But I had to pass the typing test. And by accident, I had gotten into the shorthand typing uh, aspect of high school life. And uh, I knew how to type, I knew the keyboard, but I guess I was as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. And I didn't pass the test. I didn't get the 45 words a minute. But the young lady in charge, who was also black, and that was a shock to me, Thelma, was, Thelma Fraser was her name. She told me, she said, you go home and see a movie tonight and come back in the morning and pass this test. You can type. I can tell that. Oh, my God. She said, go to the movie. She didn't know what a key, uh, something she had touched. Because going to the movies was something that I was not allowed to do. Even though I was grown, I had been married. My son was uh, almost two years old. This was in 43. Uh, Lewis had gone into service. That was my husband. We had come to a parting of the ways, and uh, he had been given a choice to go to jail or go to the Army, and he decided to go to the Army. And uh, But I still couldn't go to the show because Mama was still the boss. Now, I was 21 years old, I guess. But anyway, uh, I told Mama that I... I had to go to the show tonight. I said, the, uh, the lady in charge told me to go to the show and to relax and come back and pass the test. And I, I'm really, I, I was so excited about going to the show. And Mama gave in. She told me, okay, you can go to the show. And I thoroughly enjoyed that movie. I can't remember what it was, but I that was the best show I've ever seen in my life because I was watching it without fear of being discovered and given a licking when I got home because <laughs> Mama would apply the strap or switch or whatever she found handy. And uh, I went in the next morning and I zoomed through that test. I mean, it was really a matter of... Uh, post-hypnotic suggestion, I would say, because I went through that test with flying colors and I was hired. So, and the funny thing about it was I got a bigger salary than my friend got. She started working at uh, $1,220 a year and I got hired at 1440 
So that made me, oh my goodness, I was on the uh, real high step. We had a telephone, and that was, uh, that put us in a class all by ourselves. There were about two or three families on our block uh, with telephones, and we were the first ones. Uh, the next thing, we had a brand new Ford automobile. Now, it wasn't brand new then. We bought that Ford in 1933. It was a 1933 Ford Deluxe sedan with four doors, but it had no heater and no air conditioner. It was just a stripped-down Ford. And uh, But when my mother bought that car, she had the lights turned off, she had the gas turned off, and she disconnected the telephone. We had to put everything we had into paying the $33 a month car note. And it was predicted that Alma was going to lose that car and lose that home she's living in. And my, instead of losing it, my mother paid the last three months uh, ahead of time. She took the man $99 before she could drive back to the house, which was less than three blocks. The news was on uh, on my street that Alma had paid for that automobile. Everything you did, was it was news, uh, particularly with some families. And the Mallory family, which was Earlene's, uh, uh, where her her roots and the the Gaines family that was my mother's my mother and uh, there was one more Ruby Johnson those three women what they did was the uh, pattern for everyone else to follow but nobody ever bought that brand new automobile my mother was the only one and uh, she was the only driver. My stepfather did not drive. But uh, being church people, the, uh, usually they were uh, dealing with church work or school work. My mother was quite a community person because as long as I was in school, she was in school. And uh, so was Ruby Johnson and Rosie Mallory couldn't be there because she worked. But my mom would report back to her. So they had their little network going. Oh, my goodness. That was, we were all excited because uh, I was the oldest grandchild. And I was getting ready to bring a son into the world. And I was kind of, well, everything kind of centered around Mamie. I was the... A focal point in the family because I was a smart little kid and uh, my mother had raised me real good in the church and uh, I was excelling in school and when time came for me to bring forth the child everybody was focused in on Mamie and this baby. Well I went to the hospital and uh, on a Wednesday morning but my son wasn't born until Friday, sometime Friday. And uh, I was having difficulty with the birth. He was a breech baby. And uh, they put me in this room and they kind of forgot about me. And the water broke. And uh, when the water broke, I began to get okay. I was no longer struggling. And when they... One nurse passed by my room, and I was up helping the other lady in the bed that was in the room. And uh, she was very vocal about her birth. She was cursing her husband, and she was everything, and screaming. And I was trying to calm her down. And that's when they grabbed me and took me into delivery. And... Uh, all the time that I'd been begging them to come and see about me, they'd just been passing by. But this time I was uh, whisked into the room and uh, I thought 
uh, I thought the baby was coming, and but it didn't feel like the baby. It felt like uh, something else. And I called for a bedpan, and the doctor told me the baby is going to come out the same way he went in. And I blushed. I mean, I could feel myself turning red. I, I didn't, I don't know how I thought the doctor thought the baby got where he was, but uh, <laughs> the idea of him saying that, oh, that, that just kind of got under my skin. And then the next thing I knew, they were shooting me with a needle. They gave me, uh, what did they give me? Ether. Oh. Uh, they shot me with a needle, then they put a cone over my mouth. And I was, I didn't want that thing over my face. And well, the next thing I knew, I was waking up. Uh, the baby had been delivered, but he was a, it was a forcep delivery. And when I, when they brought the baby to me, I saw scars here, scars on his nose. He was kind of scarred up a bit. And I said, oh, what an ugly baby. And Emmett uh, jerked his head. I mean, a wee wee baby, just hours old. But it looks like that he looked up at me and he began to cry. And oh my God, I said, oh, I pulled him to me. I said, honey, mother loves you. Uh, I was trying to make up for what I had said because it seemed that he had reacted to what I said. And I didn't see him anymore. I don't know whether he, he might have been two weeks old. He might have been a month old. But I became, a, a, I had an infection following the birth. Mm. Mm. And uh, so they had to keep us, uh, we were isolated from one another. They kept him in the hospital for two weeks because the umbilical cord had wrapped around his left hand and his right knee, and that's why he was coming breech. Well, they got that straightened out. He, his knee was swollen, his arm was swollen. And when they got him, oh, passable is what I used to call it. They sent him home, but they kept me. Then they brought him back to the hospital and sent me home. So we missed one another again. He was a month old before I really got a chance to oh, have him as my own. And oh, I was so disappointed because my little baby had turned from a, a little white baby with blue eyes and blonde hair to a little brown baby. He wasn't really brown, but he was so much darker. And I wondered, was that my baby? And Mama said, oh, yes, this is your baby. Because the comment had been made at his birth that give him 30 days and he'll look the way he's supposed to look. And certainly enough, in 30 days, he was... Or uh, Emmett Till. Well, we got along wonderfully together, except that I did have to put him on a formula. Uh, I w wasn't able to breastfeed him. My milk was uh, either it wasn't enough. It was it was something wrong. I received a telegram from the U.S. Department of the Army, I guess, and they told me that your husband, Louis Till, died May and the date, uh, and I just looked at that a couple of days ago, but uh, and they said the cause of death, willful misconduct, and that was all they told me. Finally, they sent me his, uh, what few possessions he had which consisted mainly of a ring. I can't remember anything else that they sent me, but they sent uh, something. And uh, I put the ring away because I had no use for the ring and I wasn't ready to give it to, I mean, Emmett couldn't use it. He was too tiny. And he was only about uh, 
three or four or five years old at the most. So the ring was put away for another day. And uh, I began to ask the army what happened. And uh, they never would respond to me. They, they would not give me. They told me that they had told me all that they were permitted to tell me in the telegram. And uh, that's uh, that, That's all I ever heard until Senator Eastland got the information that I had been trying to get. But I was also reading an article where his buddies, uh, some of his army buddies, said that Lewis Till was railroaded. I gave him the ring. The, one day before he left going to Mississippi. And he was very excited about the ring. I mean, he he really appreciated that ring. And before he left, he s started running up the steps to board the train because we could hear the whistle blowing. And uh, he was going to join Papa Moe's and Wheeler Parker on the train. And uh, we were at 63rd Street. The train originated at 12th Street. And he was running up the steps to try to make it to the train. And I said, Emmett, or Bo, I called him Bo. I said, where are you going? You haven't kissed me goodbye. And how do I know I'll ever see you again? And he looked at me and he said, oh, Mama. He, he kind of scolded me for saying something like that. But he turned around, he came back, and uh, he kissed me goodbye. And he said, here, take this. He pulled his watch off and gave it to me. He said, I won't need this where I'm going. I said, what about your ring? He said, oh, I'm going to show it off to the fellows. And with that, he was up the steps and on his way to get on the train. Well, to me, he was perfection. You know, we mothers don't see much wrong with our sons. And I only saw him in the evening. I was at work during the daylight hours when he was up playing and doing other things that little boys do. But my mother never had any complaints about Emmett. She never told me that she spanked him. I mean... It seemed that he was just a kid that did what he was supposed to do. And she took him to church with her, so he was brought up in, in a church environment. My stepfather thought he was perfection. Mr. Gaines, uh, he was the most wonderful stepfather in the world. But one day we came home from church, mother and I, and both was straddle Papa Tom, and he was taking his finger, putting them in his nose, and uh, Papa Tom was, tears were coming out of his eyes. And when I saw what Bo was doing, and Papa was letting him do it, I grabbed him and I whacked him on his rear end. I said, you don't do that to Papa Tom. And Papa Tom raised up and he cursed me for everything he could think of because I had hit that baby. The one and only time that he ever showed any ill will towards me, but he told me to keep my hands off of that boy. So, and the kid had him crying. He knew better. <laughs> well, at age 10, we had moved to Chicago. We had gone to Detroit. And I had left Detroit and returned to Chicago for the first time. I had never, I'd lived in Argo all my life. And there were just the two of us at uh, 64th and St. Lawrence. But I had moved my uncle, my father's oldest brother, and his wife in on the first floor so that Emmett would never come home to an empty house. There was always somebody there to receive him and that he had to account to. And at age 10, 
we were 10 when we moved from Detroit back to Chicago. And we moved in about November. And later on the following year, Emmett told me, he said, if you can go out and make the money, I can take care of the house. And I dumped the house on him. I mean, it was just like I was carrying a load and I laid it down. And that kid really took care of my house. He swept, he mopped, he helped me to lay rugs, he helped me to lay tile. I mean, he was very, he was a, an able-bodied help around the house. Later he told me, he said, now mama, I could do the laundry too. And I went down and made sure that he knew how to operate the ringer machine. And then I forgot the laundry. He did the laundry. Then he decided that he could pay the bills and shop the groceries. And I remember the first time I gave him $100 to go and pay bills. And I was shaking like a leaf on a tree because $100 was a lot of money. And we didn't have checkbooks at that time. Didn't know what they, didn't even know the use of a checkbook. But Emmett went down to State and Madison. He paid a bill that I had at one of the leading stores there. And then coming back south, he stopped at Sears and the fair store and paid the bills there. He came all the way back to 63rd between Cottage Grove and Stony Island. And he paid my telephone bill, my light bill, my gas bill. And he had about 17 cents left. And he put all the paid bills on the dresser along with the change. And uh, he let me know that he knew that was his, but he would wait for me to give it to him. He wouldn't just take it. And uh, my aunt had given him permission to be out a couple doors away. And that's where he was. And when he thought I was home, he came home. And I complimented him on what a beautiful job he had done and even brought me the change. He said, well, I left it there. He said, but I earned that. I said, you certainly did. And I gave him that and an extra dollar. And that just thrilled him all the way down to his toes. He was very grateful. Uh, and then his cooking. He had two things that he liked, fried corn, and pork chops. And when he would shop, he would buy two packages of pork chops. And he would, one was for me, one was for him. And he would cook these pork chops in separate skillets because he wanted to make sure that he got his three or four or however many, and that I didn't get one of his by mistake. I mean, they, he, he really divided those chops up. Then he would open two cans of cream-style corn, and then he would come with the pepper shaker. And you have never eaten black corn in your life. That corn would be black with pepper. And I would be eating and drinking, eating and drinking, because my mouth was on fire, and I tried to discourage the use of so much pepper. I don't know if I ever succeeded or not. But to this day, I am very, very careful with the way I use black pepper. Papa Mose was in town. He had come in to Chicago to bury a friend of his. And while he was here, it was decided that two of his grandsons would return home with him for the summer. Well, Emmett was very close to the grandson that lived in Argo, Illinois, because we live next door to one another. And uh, Emmett, even though Wheeler was two years older, he and Wheeler were just, they were, they were almost soulmates. And uh, when Emmett found out that Wheeler was going, he turned the heat on me to let him go. Uh, we were going, we had already planned our vacation and we were supposed to be leaving 
um, for Detroit, Michigan to pick up a cousin and then we were going to drive to Omaha, Nebraska and visit with her relatives there. And Emmett was, had been promised that he could even drive on the highway. We were going to let him uh, try his driving skills on the highway. And uh, which I did not agree to, but that's what Gene had told him, and I wouldn't go against Gene. And uh, while we were uh, almost in the midst of getting ready, uh, well, when Emmett left going to Mississippi, something happened to me, and I became immobilized. I couldn't walk. Uh, I was feeling fine, but my legs just wouldn't uh, support my body. And by the time I got back home from the train station, I was forced to crawl up the steps. And uh, so that persisted for a week. But in order for Emmett to go to Mississippi, uh, my mother and I felt it would be necessary to speak to Papa Mose and give him some words of caution for the boys, three Chicago boys going to Mississippi, and they're going to be with at least three or four of Papa Mose's boys, and it was time to really uh, zero in and help these Chicago boys survive the summer. And uh, they laughed at us. They they thought we were so silly, Mama and and me, for us to be coming over about this one little chick. Well, that's all we had. We had one little chick. The rest of them had many sons, many daughters. They were loaded with relatives, nieces, nephews, etc. But we just had the one. And the argument that Emmett used to get me, that made me cave in, he said, well, Mama, how is it that you and Mamu could take two of Uncle Moses' daughters and raise them? And we had taken Thelma when she was in third grade, and she was in second year teacher's college then. Uh, Loretha, we took her in seventh grade, and she had finished high school and had gone to work to help Thelma make it through Chicago Teachers College. And uh, Emmett couldn't understand how I could take them, and they hadn't even been back to the South to see their parents, and yet you won't let me go for a week. And that kind of, that really got to my mother and it got to me. So we were both coming over to the daughter's house, to Moses Wright's daughter's house, who was the mother of Curtis Jones. And uh, we were going to meet up over there. I didn't know she was coming. She didn't know I was coming. But I was parking on the east side of the street, and she was parking in, on the west side of the street in front of their house. And that's when they laughed. Oh, they thought that was the most ridiculous things thing, how Concer concerned we were about this one little kid. And uh, we laughed at one another. I didn't know you were coming. Well, I certainly didn't know you were coming, but we arrived at the same hour. And uh, we went in and we cautioned Papa Moe's and we talked to the boys. And uh, I said, well, we need to pray about this. And Mama said, well, I've already prayed. And uh, we finally gave our consent, and then we had to stop, we had to unpack and repack Emmett because I had his thing, they were kind of interpacked. And uh, when we got all through, we were supposed to meet Papa Moe's down at the 12th Street Station, but we just couldn't make it. So we went to the 63rd Street Station and that's where Emmett and I parted. And that's when my knees, my legs gave out. Nothing wrong with my knees, ankles, anything. But the strength went out of my legs and they would not function. I don't even know how I got back to my car, but I did. 
And but by the time I got home, I was reduced to crawling. I let them know that Mississippi was not Chicago. And when you go to Mississippi, you're living by an entirely different set of rules. Uh, it is yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, yes, sir, and no, sir. And, Bo, if you see a white woman coming down the street, you get off the sidewalk and drop your head. Don't even look at her as she passes by. Now, I was really going to extremes. I didn't know that that was really the custom down there. But I have read since then that that was the custom. You get off the sidewalk and you lower your head. You don't look a white person in the eye. And uh, I guess I, I made things as scary as I could possibly make them. And I, I just had to instill it in him what to do and what not to do. I bought that wallet at, uh, uh, it was a store that had been, it was a theater that had been converted into a store. It was formerly the South Town Theater, which was a beautiful place. I mean, it was so magnificent. And it was near 63rd in Halstead. It was on 63rd Street, about a block west, uh, east of Halstead. And it had become a almost a junk store. I mean, it almost looked like uh, Jewtown. We have a section in Chicago that we used to call Jewtown, and that's where all the stuff was out and uh, picked over and rummaged through and whatnot. But we had to get that wallet. We had to get several other things that he needed. And we had quite a problem selecting a wallet. At that time, there were pictures of movie stars in the wallets and a little uh, biographical sketch of them. And uh, Emmett had Hedy Lamar in one hand and Dorothy Lamour in the other hand, and he couldn't decide which one he wanted. But if I remember correctly, I think he chose Hedy Lamar. I don't really know. But anyway, whichever one, that was the picture that was in the wallet. And that was the picture that Milam and Bryant claimed Emmett said was his girlfriend. In order for Emmett to take this trip, we had to pick up a few items uh, of, in order for him to go. And one of these was a wallet. And we had gone to this store, and we were searching through the wallets, and he selected two. One had a picture of Hedy Lamar, one had Dorothy uh, Lamour. And both of these were sort of his favorites. And he was having a lot of difficulty d deciding which one to take. But if I remember correctly, he took the one with Hedy Lamar's picture in it. And that's a picture that he had in his wallet that Milam and Bryant said he said was, their, was his girlfriend. Moses Wright was a preacher. And uh, he was a sanctified preacher, and he pastored a couple of churches uh, because they didn't have enough preachers to go around. So quite often, one minister would take over two or three churches. And he had the one there at money, and I don't know where the other one was. But uh, he was a hard-working man. He was small and wiry, but, oh, could that young, could that old man work? And he knew how to work his crew. Uh, his children, his grandchildren, or whoever was around, they all went to the field. So his boys were accustomed to field work. Emmett wasn't, but Emmett would go. Emmett would help at Elizabeth at the house. When she would get up and fix breakfast, he would stay until the breakfast dishes were done, 
and she they would go to the garden and select what they were going to have for dinner. And when all of those pots were on, then Emmett would go to the field. He would usually go after uh, the boys and Papa Moe's came in for their lunch. Then he would go back with them then. And uh, another thing that really excited her, Emmett could handle the washing machine and he would wash every day. Uh, well, she had a lot of people to wash for. In addition to her own family, which was about seven or eight people, then she had two or three babies she was taking care of, babysitting, and then her stepdaughters would bring their laundry over and she would wash for them. I mean, it was an ongoing wash cycle. And by Emmett being accustomed to using a washing machine, he could do a lot of that work for her. And that just thrilled her to death, as you will see in the letters that she wrote. Now I wonder if he did. He seemed to be taking it all in what I was telling him. But there was something about him that made me think he thought I was exaggerating, which I was. I was trying to exaggerate. Uh, if I could uh, go high enough, I things could see, uh, uh, soak into his head that you have to be very careful. And uh, now he told me that he understood, and that's all I could go by. Now, the other boys were accustomed to going to Mississippi, not Wheeler, but the other boy, Curtis. And uh, oddly enough, uh, Willie Bay, his mother, would not let him go when Papa Bo's, Bo, and Wheeler went. He didn't go until the following Saturday. Maybe he arrived a couple hours before the men forced their way in. Mm -hmm. Emmett was a kid who loved to play. He was outdoors. And we noticed that every night his temperature would go up. Every day he was as fine as could be. But the minute night came on, that temperature would soar. So I told my mother, I said, Mom, you take him to the doctor and find out what this is all about. And that's when he was diagnosed as having polio. And, uh, the polio never stopped him during the day, but it stopped him every night. And uh, when he was, uh, when he had recovered from polio, we noticed that his speech was not the way it had been. Uh, I don't know if what was uh, affected that made his made him have a stutter, but he the speech impediment never lessened. I mean, it seemingly, it just went on and on. And we began to take him to doctors and clinics and what have you. And after over a year of this, we were told at one of Chicago's finest clinics, which was uh, Illinois Search and Research, they called it. And uh, the doctor there told me he would probably outgrow it. And that was the last, uh, he was having speech therapy in school and what have you. But uh, I noticed that anything he memorized, he could give that back to you perfectly. And that's when I started having him memorize this, that, and the other. According to a visitation I had, the uh, Wednesday after I received the message that Emmett's body had been recovered from the river. Uh, for the first time since that Sunday, I went to bed. My mother prevailed with me to go and lie down. And uh, when I went into the room and I had gotten pretty comfortable, but of course, you know, my mind was going like a washing machine. And all of a sudden, 
a presence filled the room. It was just like a huge cloud and it filled every corner and every inch of the room. And I recognized that as the presence of God himself. And I began to talk to him and I was uh, speaking in a, 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 a scolding voice, you know, why, why? And I heard him, I reached out my hand and I felt the contact and I was pulled to a sitting position. And I began to ask the Lord, why Emmett? I mean, he was a church going boy. He was a good kid. And uh, it looks, it seemed to me that he had been punished for the, uh, just unreasonably punished. And the Lord began to talk to me in a booming voice. They were not words. I didn't understand a single word, but I knew everything that was being said. It was like it was a boom, the roar of thunder, but I could understand what was being said. And the thing that the Lord said to me was, Emmett did not belong to you. You should be grateful to have been able to keep him for the short time he was on the earth. But Emmett was mine. I sent him here to do a job, and Emmett has done that job well. The Lord told me, he said, I've taken one, but I will give you thousands. And uh, I really, I, I puzzled over that briefly because I had been wanting more children and uh, I had never conceived again. And I just wondered where the thousands were coming from. But uh, uh, the Lord went on to say that his son, Jesus, came here that men might have a choice between eternal life or eternal damnation. My son Emmett came here so that men would have, a, would have the right to a free life and uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness here on earth. And he said, Emmett has done his job. And now it's up to you to do your job. And I drew back. Uh, I was very uh, upset about having a job to do. I thought I had already done a job. And to put another burden on me was just more than I could accept. But he continued to talk to me and I continued to listen. And I remember when the little dove told me uh, all you have to do is obey. And I decided that I would be obedient to the voice of the Lord. I knew who I was talking to. And when the conversation closed, I could feel the grip on my hand easing. And as it eased, I uh, went back upon the pillow and I went sound asleep. I didn't wake up until late the next morning and my mother came in the room and began to call me because she didn't know if I'd had a heart attack and died or what. But she awakened me and persuaded me to get up and have breakfast. And that was the first meal I remember eating since I had gotten to her house that Sunday morning. To tell you the truth, I was so far removed from Milam and Bryant until I really had no reaction. It was as if some it was as if my mind was a giant blackboard and someone had taken an eraser and just erased all traces of Milam and Bryant from my mind. I looked at it. I didn't really react to it and uh it was just something that should not have happened, but it did. And what was I going to do about it? Nothing at all. I didn't waste any time fretting over that. It said to black people that we can no longer go along with customs as they are and grin and bear it. 
we have got to shake these shackles off. We've got to stand up. We've got to be men and women. And uh, when the pressure, when people begin to oppress us, we have to resist. We cannot take this sitting down, lying down, running and crying. It's time to get up and do. And Emmett's death was the opening of the civil rights movement. He became not only the impetus for the civil rights movement, but he was the sacrificial lamb of the movement. And uh, when people saw what had happened to my son, they men stood up who had never stood up before. People became vocal who had never vocalized before. And uh, people decided that they were going to shake the shackles of intimidation. They weren't going to live this way any longer. And there was even a, a, a group that was forming to go to Mississippi and fight for uh, the true, for a life, for a normal lifestyle. Uh, I understand that they were discouraged somewhat. I don't know whether they sent out troops or what, but they were blocked. They never made it to Mississippi. But it was with this in mind that I was able to do some of the things I did because I knew that if they killed me, the men in Chicago, Illinois, if nowhere else, would rise up to fight, to fight for me. And this gave me the courage to go ahead and do some of the things that I did. I stayed in Mount Bayou because it was an all-black town. And there was a doctor there by the name of T.R.M. Howard. He was uh, revered in, in that particular part of the country. And no white people would come into Mount Bayou because they were afraid of the black people there. Uh, Dr. Howard was, uh, uh, he had a clinic. Uh, and a hospital in Mount Bio. And he was, he was really looked up to. He was appreciated. He was revered. And uh, his house was uh, something that you would think about in, in uh, one of the women's magazines. It was a beautiful place. It was very spacious. And he had one armed guard that I saw. I don't know how many more, but this was an elderly man who carried a shotgun and ever so often he would make an appearance around that house. And uh, But it was our impression that there were many more people surrounding the house to make sure that no one uh, tried, attempted to do us bodily harm while we were there. And every morning when time came for us to go to court, uh, Dr. Howard would furnish us two automobiles, a limo and a convertible Oldsmobile with air conditioning. I'd never seen a convertible with air. And I begged to ride in that car one day and I got the thrill of going to uh, uh, Sumner in that car. But that night they put me back in the limo that had the dark glasses you could not see inside. And uh, it, uh, every day, Dr. Howard was going among the people, trying to drum up witnesses, people who would testify. And uh, he didn't find he didn't find many. I don't I don't know if he found any, but uh, he did learn a lot of things. He met Evers and uh, Ruby Hurley, who was a I don't know what Ruby was, but she was a an officer for the NAACP. I think Medgar was a field representative. I don't know exactly what the title was. So but, you, so I'm sorry. Let me just follow follow up real quick. Okay. Go close. Those three people were instrumental in trying to find witnesses, getting Moses right in and out of Sumner, and I understand that one time they shipped him out in a casket. 
I knew that with the armed guards and with the people looking out for Dr. Howard and for his guest, I felt that I would be safe. Emmett was calling me. Just whenever he felt like it, he would pick up the phone. And I discouraged that because that was a long distance call. And I reminded him that he could write. And while he was at Papa Moses' house, he wrote me two letters. And uh, in these letters, he would tell me what a wonderful time he was having and uh, the things that they had done and the things they were looking forward to doing. And it seems like he wrote me one of these letters on a Friday and Saturday he was supposed to be going to Uncle Crosby's house. And uh, somehow that got switched over to Sunday. They were going to leave Sunday after church instead. And of course, uh, before day Sunday morning, that's when the invasion took place. Mm -hmm. But had they gone Saturday as they had purpose to do, uh, he would have been able to avoid this confrontation. Uh, a day before he left for Mississippi, I gave him his father's ring. And uh, when I gave it to him, he it really expressed a lot of excitement over getting Lewis's ring. And uh, he put it on his finger and it fitted because Emmett was kind of stocky, but it wasn't, it was a little bit loose on his finger, but not enough to hurt. And uh, he was, he, you know, you would see him ever so often looking down at his hand. And uh, when he got ready to leave, when he departed from me at the train station, he said he was going to keep the ring and show it to his friends. Now, this is the last letter that I received from Emmett. It's dated August 25th, 1955. Dear Mom, how is everybody? I hope you and Jean are fine. I hope you'll... I hope you all had a nice trip. I am having a fine time. Uh, we'll be home uh, next week. Please have my motorbike fixed for me. Uh, this is one of two letters that I received from Emmett. Uh, he was, we never lost communication because he was calling and I had to discourage the calling because he was calling collect. And uh, or he didn't have any limit on the time he was using. So I uh, reminded him that, you know, you can write me a letter. And this was the second letter and the last letter that I received from him, which was probably on Saturday morning. And he was taken out of the house before day, Sunday morning. And uh, oh, I didn't hear about it until 9.30 Sunday morning. I received a telephone call at 9.30 Sunday morning. It was from Moses Wright's oldest daughter, Willie Mae Jones, the mother of Curtis Jones. And uh, Evidently, she had received a call from Curtis uh, telling her what had happened. She called me, but she was so hysterical until I couldn't understand what she was saying. And I told her to hang up. And I called my mother, who lived close by, and asked her to go over and see what the world was wrong with Willie Mae. And my mother called me back to let me know that Bo had been kidnapped. Oh, my goodness. I don't really know how I felt. I wasn't really frightened, but I was very apprehensive. I kind of thought these men, whoever they were, would take him and 
uh, give him a real good licking and bring him back to Papa Moe's. It never occurred to me that they would uh, kill him. But I jumped out of bed and I made up my bed. Then I called Jean. Uh, he lived about eight blocks away. And I said, Jean, I want you to take me to my mother's house. And uh, he had to either get public transportation, a cab, or a walk from where he lived to where I lived. But it seemed that he got to me so quickly. Uh, but by the time he got there, I had notified Uncle Mac and Aunt Magnolia downstairs. I had called the news media, uh, every newspaper I could think of, and uh, I didn't call any TV stations, but they picked up the story. All I knew to do was call the newspapers. And the uh, Daily News wanted to talk to me at length, and I told them to meet me at my mother's house, which was on the west side, gave them the address. When Jean got there, I was ready to go. And uh, Jean was stopping at every stop sign and stopping at every red light. And I didn't have time for that. I told him to move over, pull over. And Jean did what I asked him to do, and I took the wheel. And he said, oh, you're going to get a ticket. The police is going to stop you. I said, well, I hope they do. Then they can put the siren on and get me to Mama's house faster uh, because that, there was no stopping. I had to get to Mama. And when I got there, surely enough, the, def the uh, Chicago Daily News was there. They were waiting on the steps for me to arrive. I didn't find out any information. I mean, every every place I called, it was a block there. They didn't know anything. Uh, the people that we knew personally, uh, they were they had to go to church. They couldn't help us with the situation. Uh, and I mean, everybody was preoccupied. I couldn't get the governor right away. I finally got him but I couldn't get the sheriff. It was almost mission impossible. It was uh, as if uh, Mississippi had been sealed off with an iron curtain. I mean, there was no information coming out of there whatsoever. I didn't even call any black people for help. I was calling on white people that we knew. And uh, Mr. Macfall, he was quite a, uh, he was a renown in the neighborhood. And Mr. Macfall told me, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have time to look after that. Now I'm on my way to church. And so he, I guess he went on to church. And everybody we called had something they had to do, and they could not change their plans. I found out from, uh, not United Press, what is the other one? Mm. Uh, one of the news agencies. Press? Yes, uh, one of the news agencies called and they wanted to speak to somebody in the house except me. And I knew immediately what they had to, it was this, as if I had something telling me what was going to happen next. And I told him, I said, sir, there's no one in this house you can talk to except me. And I want you to just give me the news slowly so I can write it down. I don't want to make any mistakes. Well, he would not talk to me, Associated Press, that's who it was. And uh, he wanted to know, did I have any friends? And I gave him the name of my friend in Argo, Illinois, Ollie Williams. And he called her and gave her the story. She, in turn, called me back. Well, I was the one who was answering the phone. I was manning all the telephones. 
And uh, she wanted to speak to my mother. And I said, Ollie, the message you have, you cannot give it to my mother. You've got to give it to me. I said, Mama can't take it. And uh, I said, because I want details and nobody is going to take the details as I will. And she finally was persuaded to give me the message. And she described how his body had been found, how Moses Wright had identified him by the ring on his finger. And uh, she told me about the gin fan that was around his neck, wired with barbed wire around his neck and the other end to that huge gin fan. And he was thrown into the Tallahatchie River. But by some accident, uh, he had become tangled with some undergrowth. And the body couldn't continue to float down the river. And the foot just went up. The, uh, one of his feet went up above the surface of the water. And there was a young white man. John Hodges, who was fishing with his dad. And he spotted that foot and he told uh, his daddy that there's somebody in the river. Well, the search for Emmett Till had become very intense. And uh, when the sheriff came down, he immediately sent for Moses Wright. And Moses Wright came and he said that he couldn't tell it was Bo by looking at him. But when he saw the ring on his finger, he said, yes, that's him. That's his ring. And that is the way he identified Evan. Oh, my God. Those words were like arrows sticking all over my body. And uh, I had had this visitation by this little white dove who had told me, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will take care of you. All you have to do is obey. And as Ali was talking to me, I was trying to write, and I would stop her ever so often because my eyes were so full of tears until I couldn't see, and I needed to uh, clear my vision, and then I would go back to writing. and. She was so reluctant to give me that information. She wanted to talk to my mother because my mother was the, oh, uh, she was the, the force in the family. But I had looked at my mother and I realized that my mother, I was going, this is one thing I was going to have to do. Mother could not do this one for me. And when I began to make the announcement, oh, that Emmett had been found uh, and how he was found, the whole house began to scream and to cry. And my mother fell prostrate on the floor. And uh, the people that were able to, they were around her. They had just sealed her in. And I stood up and went towards her. And as I approached her on the floor, I felt a surge of something like electricity coming from her to me. And I stepped back because it seemed that if I stayed there, I would zap all the life out of her body. So I moved back and I began to tell the people, give her air. Uh, get from around her, get her head up. I was telling them how to take care of mother. And that's when I realized that this was a load that I was going to have to carry. I wouldn't get any help carrying this load. Yes, when the sheriff uh, summoned Moses right to the river side. And when Papa Mose identified Bo by the ring on his finger, uh, Sheriff Strider gave the body to, uh, told Moses Wright to take the body 
and it had to be buried before the sun went down that night. And uh, Moses Wright was very obedient. He took the body to the church cemetery. They had dug the grave, and they were preparing to put Emmett in the grave. When uh, Curtis spoke up and said, Granddaddy, are you going to bury Bo without talking to Mamie? And uh, that stopped them. They, they ceased operations. And he said, I need to call Mamie. And uh, his grandfather told him, if you can get a call through, go ahead and call her. And they waited to see what would uh, what Curtis would be able to do. But he went to home after home after home, mostly white homes in the area, and no one would allow him to use the telephone. Uh, in the meantime, <laughs> uh, when we got the word and I was able to get the house quieted down, I told them it's something we have to do and I don't know what it is and you're going to have to help me think. And uh, I was telling them how futile it was to be crying. I said, we don't have enough tears to cry for Emmett Till. The world will cry for Emmett Till. And uh, my aunt spoke up and she said, call the undertaker, call A.A. A. Rayner. Well, we did that. And A.A. A. Rayner is the one that reached the uh, people, the right people in Mississippi and laid claim to the body. But he was very skeptical. He told, he called back and he wanted to know, he said, it's going to cost $3,300 to get the body out of Mississippi. And he wanted to know, could we pay it? And uh, I told him, Mr. Rayner, regardless to the cost, I want the body. I said, if I live, I'll pay you. If I don't live, somebody else will pay you. You will get paid. And uh, we, I was able to live up to that promise. Uh, when we buried Emmett, enough money had come through my hands that I was able to pay him in full, and I had about $250 left, which I put in a, a savings account. They wanted to get it in the ground as quickly as possible. They didn't want nightfall to catch that body unburied. Oh, that's obvious. The way that body had been mutilated, they didn't want anybody to see what what those devils had done. Oh, the That was something to be hidden. It was not to be advertised, it was not to be photographed, it was not to be even heard of anymore. Just bury this body and let's get on with our lives. But they wanted that body in the ground as quickly as possible. They didn't want any fanfare about it at all. Okay, great. And they had no intention of letting the body out of Mississippi. What do you mean? They were not, they, Shipping that body to Chicago uh, was not something they intended to do. And it took the intervention of a white undertaker that A.A. A. Rayner communicated with. And he, in turn, went to the black uh, undertaker who was a subsidiary of his, uh, they had a white and a black branch. And it was through the white owner that we got the body on the train. I was told that the train wouldn't take the body because of the odor. And, oh, I was told a lot of impossible things, but I didn't waver. I said, I want the body, I want the body. And when the body arrived at 12th Street Station, I went down to receive the body. And to my surprise, there were hundreds of people there. And when I looked up and saw this huge box, it, it, it was almost as if the box crushed me to the ground. And uh, one of the things that was foremost on, on my mind, I wanted to see. 
uh, I had to see what was in the box. And it was then that I was told about the uh, affidavits that had been signed, the Mississippi seal that was on the big box, the box inside that one, and the third box that housed the casket. All of these had seals and padlocks on them. And it was not to be opened. And uh, Mr. Rayner tried to explain to me that he would be in trouble with the Mississippi authorities if he opened the box. And I didn't care anything about the Mississippi authorities. I wanted to get in the box. And when he just told me he couldn't do it, I reflected a moment and I asked him, Mr. Rayner, do you have a hammer? And that kind of startled him. Uh, and he wanted to know, what are you going to do with the hammer? I said, I haven't signed anything and I haven't made any promises. And if you can't open those box, that box, I can, because I'm only expecting one box with the casket inside. But there was a box within the big box and then another box was inside the second box and then the casket was inside the third box. And uh, oh, when, oh, when, we, when Mr. Rayner agreed to go into the box, that's when we found all of these other padlocks, four padlocks in all, and every one with the Mississippi seal on it. We went to the train station of uh, the 12th Street Station, Illinois Central, and uh, we were waiting for the box, for the, for the body to be brought into the area where we were. And all of a sudden I looked up and there was this huge box. It looked almost, well, it looked almost as if it were the size of a freight car. And uh, a, a really ugly box, but so big. And I wondered, why such a huge box? And uh, I later found out that it was one of three boxes, because there was a box inside the huge box. And the, the huge one had a seal and a padlock on it. The box inside it had a seal and a padlock. The third box had a seal and a padlock. And inside the third box was the casket with the seal and a padlock. And I was told that the only way the body was released to come to Chicago was that affidavits were signed and promises would, were made that the box would not be opened. And uh, of course, I objected to that immediately. I mean, uh, when I went up, uh, when I saw the casket, it seems as if uh, during that time, between then and the time I actually looked over in the casket to see what Bo looked like, I had a sensation that every bone had turned to steel. And I looked, I mean, the the uh, sensation was so intense until I looked at myself to see could I see the physical changes that were taking place in my body. And uh, my father and Jean were on either side of me to hold me up. And I told them, turn me loose. I said, I, I'm not going to faint now. I've got a job to do. I've got to try to figure out what this is. And uh, they had, when I looked inside the casket, all I saw was a huge something in a body bag with a lot of white pellets all over the body, all in the bag. And I told Mr. Rayner, I said, I can't see what's in the box. All, I mean, you're going to have to wash it off so I can see it. Well, they were very patient with me. They took the body to the back of the casket of the funeral parlor where they dressed the bodies, where they 
present them, get them ready for presentation. And uh, they took him out of the body bag and they washed him off and they called me back and let me look at him there. And when I glanced at his face, I had to turn away. I just couldn't look him in the face. And I remember I started at his feet and I checked uh, certain checkpoints all the way up until I got to his neck. But one thing I observed was that he had not been castrated. He was all there. But that rumor has persisted that he was castrated and his uh, intimate parts stuffed in his mouth. Well, that was not true. I felt that that box was on top of me, crushing me to the ground. I felt the weight of that box. And I just, I was not prepared to see anything so huge. And I had no idea how I would feel when I ob observed what he was returned to me in. I just did, I was totally unprepared for that. They didn't want me to look, but I had to look because I had to be sure that I was going to bury Emmett. I mean, even, uh, you know, with $3,300 staring me in the face, I didn't want to bury nothing or somebody else. I wanted to make sure that I was burying Emmett. And that was the, uh, the whole idea behind seeing what was in the box because I realized they could have filled it with bricks. They could have put mud in it. It could have been somebody else's body. I had to know for sure. Even my father didn't want me to look. Nobody wanted me to look at Emmett, but I had to look at Emmett. I mean, how he looked was not the issue. I had to make sure I had Emmett, mm -hmm. and that was the only way I could be sure. I started at his feet, and there were little things that I could identify on my way up to his head. Uh, because after all, I'd been bathing him for a long time. Uh, I had to stop at age five. He would let me bathe him after age five. So when I paused at his midsection, I, I got a little jolt because I knew he would not want me looking at him. Uh, but I saw enough that I knew he was intact. In fact, there were very few blemishes on his body until you got to his neck and all of the scarring all of the beating was about his head and uh, I saw that his tongue was choked out and it was way down below his chin and it was such a big tongue I didn't know human beings had tongues so big and uh, as I came on up I noticed that there was a, the right eye was lying on midway his cheek. And I noticed that his nose had been broken like somebody took a meat chopper and chopped his nose in several places. I looked for this eye and it was gone, uh, just as if somebody had picked it out with a net picker. And I went back to examine his ears because his ears were not attached to his face and the end of it curled up a little bit. And uh, I couldn't find the ear. I only found a portion of an ear. And I wanted to know, where is that? As I kept looking, I saw a hole which I presumed was a bullet hole. And I could look through that hole and see daylight on the other side. And I wondered, was it necessary to shoot it? Oh, uh, it seemed like that was the final insult, the uh, shot through the head. But I also noticed that the fore part of his face 
and the back of his head were separated. They had come down over his head with a, a not an axe, but a hatchet. That's what Willie Reed, I think Willie Reed said that. And uh, the front of the face and the back of the head were in separate pieces. And Mr. Rayner uh, asked me, he said, do you want me to touch the body up? I said, no, let the people see what I've seen. I said, America needs to know what is going on in the South. And uh, I turned to Jean. I said, Jean, what are your thoughts? He said, well, that's Bo, all right. He said, because I'll never forget his head. He said, and I gave him that haircut. Jean was his barber. So not only did I have my verification, I had Jean's as well. When I glanced in his face, I had to turn away. I could not. Uh, focus on his face. And I decided then that I would start at his feet and work my way up, uh, maybe gathering strength as I went. And when I got to his ankles, I noticed those little sharp bones in his ankle. Okay, that was Emmett's ankle. And I came on up his leg until I got to his knee. And his knees were like my knees. He didn't have knobby knees. A lot of people have knobby knees, but he had flat knees. And uh, I said, those are his knees. And I came on up to his midsection. And I just paused long enough to note that he was still intact. Nobody had uh, castrated him or anything like that, as the rumors had had it. And uh, I kept on up until I got to his chin. And then I, I was forced to deal with his face. And that's when I noticed his tongue hanging below his chin. And uh, I noticed that the, the size of the tongue, it was unbelievable. It was bigger than the tongues that my mother used to cook, the beef tongues that my mother used to cook. And I was amazed that a human being's tongue would be so big, but I don't know if that was due to uh, the body being waterlogged or what it was. But I moved on up from the chin until I got, I saw the eye that was lying uh, dangling from the eye socket and about halfway the right cheek. And I looked on the other side and that eye was completely out as if it had been picked out. I noticed the bridge of his nose, which had been, it looked as if it had been chopped. And from there, I went to look at his ear, the right ear, because I was on the right side. And I noticed that the part of the ear that I was looking for was missing. And I wondered, where is his ear? And I couldn't uh, identify the ear because it was non-existent. But I saw this bullet hole around the temple area, and I could see daylight through the bullet hole. And I wondered why. Was it really necessary to shoot him? Because by then he should have been dead. Uh, that body wouldn't, he, he wouldn't be able to take all of that punishment and yet be alive. But I also noticed that the front of his face and the back of his head had been chopped with something like a, a hatchet. And the, the face and the back of the head were separated. Now there's a picture that was taken by Jet Magazine. And on the left side, you can see all the thread they used to sew the back of the head and the face back together to make it one unit. And uh, Mr. Rayner asked me, he said, uh, do you want me to touch the body up? I said, no, Mr. Rayner, let the people see what I've seen. 
uh, I, I was just willing to bear it all. I think everybody needed to know what had happened to Emmett Till. And, uh, but when I came back that evening, I was amazed at how much better he looked than when I had seen him. The eye was gone, the tongue was back in his mouth, his mouth was all pooped out like, a, like he, well, it was all, it was protruding. Uh, I saw the stitches on the side where they had sewn him back together. And I turned to Mr. Rayner, I said, Mr. Rayner, you have done a beautiful job. And he looked at me, but from what I had seen previously, he had done a beautiful job. Those pictures are fantastic when it comes to what I originally saw. The, the pictures were 10 times better than Emmett looked when I looked at his body unretouched. He did a whole lot of work. Uh, they closed his mouth, they removed that eye, they got his tongue back in his mouth, they sewed his head and skull back together. I mean, they did an awful lot of work. Well, the crowd was so huge at the funeral parlor until I knew that uh, the people could not pass by the funeral and uh, by the body. Uh, it would take hours for that crowd to dissipate and people were still coming. So uh, it was necessary for me to come forth and help control the crowd. We had quite a few white police officers and when they would push the crowd back, there would be an angry explosion. There would be swearing and everything. Uh, the white policemen were just not welcome. The black people were ready to tear them to shreds. So they put me in a window and I stood in the window and I talked to the crowd and I told them that they would be able to come in and view Emmett but please let us uh, go ahead with what we had to do. And when we left, the body would still be available. And when I would talk to them, they would quiet down and they would ease up. But early Saturday morning, this was Friday evening, early Saturday morning, I received a call from Rayner and he said, oh, would you please tell us where we can relocate the body because they're going to tear my establishment off of its foundation. And I told him to take the body to 4021 South State Street. That was the mother church of the Churches of God in Christ in Illinois. And <clears throat> uh, Bishop Isaiah Roberts was the pastor. And uh, I don't know. I didn't call him and ask him, could I do this? I just did it. And oddly enough, he accepted the assignment. He put Emmett in the basement and the people would, would come in one door. They would pass by the casket. Then they had two ways they could go out. They could go out a side door or they could go out the way they came in. So... <clears throat> Uh, the people walked day and night. Uh, I got two or three reports from the, uh, pro the procession that was going on there. And uh, I was told that somebody had put out two number three wash tubs. Those are the tubs we used to bathe in. And uh, they were being filled with money and ever so often they would disappear. Well, they would disappear and they would put out two more tubs. And it seems that people were just dropping money like mad. And uh, out of that money, I got enough to take care of the funeral. And I had about $250 left over, which I put in a savings account.
Well, I knew that I could not tell people what I had seen. Number one, they wouldn't believe me. But if I had two or three hundred witnesses, then all of us could testify to what they had done to Emmett. And I thought the world needed to know what was going on in Mississippi. And that was the only way they would know would be for me to pull the cover off and let them see, let the world see what was going on. Very emotional. Uh, number one, the church was crowded to the extent that we didn't know if the balconies were going to collapse and fall down on the rest of the people or what. But again, I had to speak over the loudspeaker and tell the people if they would just be patient and let us have our funeral, we would leave and the church would be open for them to uh, come and go as long as they wanted to. Because uh, I thought that pretty soon the crowd would die down. I, it looked like all of Chicago was there. and. But this procession uh, continued from Friday evening until Tuesday afternoon. We had uh, uh, Labor Day coming in there on a Monday. And that meant that all day Saturday, all day Sunday, all day Monday until about noon Tuesday, people were marching. And they said that about one in every five had to be assisted out of the building. They would just go into a faint. Uh, pregnant women were coming and their families were trying to dissuade them for, from looking at what was in the casket, but they came anyway. And uh, they had to tie off the State Street traffic because the the crowd spilled from the sidewalk, which was unusually wide, all the way out into the uh, roadway itself. And they rerouted the traffic. And uh, uh, Tuesday, when I got back to take Emmett and go to Burr Oak with him, uh, they had to force an opening for me to get through. And uh, we went in, we led the body out, and we proceeded to Burr Oak Cemetery. And I am told that that is the largest procession in the history of Chicago. And the only one might have exceeded it. And that was when Mayor Washington died. Oh, the people that I have talked to wanted their children to remember what had happened to Emmett Till. And they wanted them to, uh, face, to face up to reality that the black man in America is not free. And uh, uh, this is all that I can say. They wanted their children to know the dangers of living in America because so many people sent their children south for the summer. When school was out, the kids would go south. And they wanted them to know that it is very hazardous in the south, so you have to watch your step. Not really. Uh, I contributed to the NAACP and I always gave in the community chest uh, a rally that was taken up to divide among the various charities. But my job was, was my job. I had to raise Emmett and I had to go to my job. And I never took a day off from work. And uh, I mean, I was just, uh, in my own personal little groove. And I thought I, I, when I took care of Emmett and took care of the job that I had, that was just all I could do. Well, number one, 
if I had had to hold all of this inside of me, I would have exploded. I needed to talk about it. I needed to wake people up. You know, it wasn't a job that I could do alone. It was going to take a lot of us working together to change the scenario. And there were so many people who were after me to come and speak. And uh, I was afraid of falling into the hands of the wrong people. I didn't want to get involved with any uh, communist or any disreputable organizations. So I went to New York and I asked Roy Wilkins, the head of the NAACP, to help me to uh, set up my places of speaking for me because I figured they would know who was legit and who was not. And uh, in the meantime, he told me that my speaking would generate funds for them to send a, an attorney to Mississippi with me uh, to fight my case. So I was more than willing to talk and uh, gather the money to help this. What I didn't know was that the NAACP was broke following Brown versus the Board of Education. I read later in Jet Magazine that I, in three months I had raised uh, $250,000 for them. And that was, oh my God, that was money, money, money. Now it doesn't seem very significant. But in 1955, if you had $10,000 in your bank account, you were secure for life. You didn't have to worry about, you had no financial worries. So $250,000, that, uh, th that was really, they were on their feet again. So that's why I was able and willing to go and speak where they had me to speak. I was elated. I thought that uh, we have won a victory already. Just, uh, just the fact that two white men had been arrested for a crime against a black man. So that in itself was a giant step forward. That it was a circus atmosphere. Uh, number one, the temperature was, it was in, in unbearably hot. In the courtroom, they recorded 118 degrees. And of course, there was no air conditioning. Uh, they had the ceiling fans that were only stirring the air up, making it hotter when it reached your body. Uh, outside, there was the uh, sun beaming down and the people the curiosity seekers, they, uh, it was really like they were going to a big uh, celebration of some kind. They wanted to know what was going to happen with this black woman down here testifying and all of that stuff because I was not supposed to be in Mississippi. They had threatened me and had threatened Mayor Daley if he allowed me to come. But... Uh, I had made the decision that I had no choice in the matter. I had to be in Mississippi. I had business there. And uh, it was with this in mind that I went. And when my father said he would go with me, oh my God, I felt like I had the whole world on my side. And then there was Rayfield Moody, my stepfather's nephew. He said, I asked him, would he go? He said, what do you mean, will I go? He said, if you go, I go. And here I am with these two daring men, a one on each side. I just felt like I could conquer the world. And uh, so this was the, this was our attitude. But when we got there, we experienced something altogether different. They were belligerent. They were angry that I was coming in here to, in there to upset their way of life. 
and they didn't spare any pains to let me know how unwelcome I was. Like dirt. Uh, I felt, uh, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was nothing. Uh, I was looked at and over. Uh, other people were being served in the courtroom, and I was dying of thirst. And when we would try to get service, uh, they would look at us like we were invisible and turn their heads and go in the other direction. There was nothing we could buy in that courtroom. If we needed to take a rest break, we had to leave the courtroom and go about two blocks in the hot sun to a black cafe. And that's where we were able to relieve ourselves. The uh, uh, accused were given free access to the judges' chambers. When they needed to go, they went into the judges' chambers, and that's where they did whatever they had to do and came back. I didn't feel... I wasn't amused or uh, thrilled by them having their sons on their knees because they they looked after their children during the proceedings. And uh, the kids were fidgety, as two and three-year-olds would be, and uh, they were demanding a whole lot of attention, which they were getting, and they wanted to eat, they wanted to drink, and so did the fathers. They were eating and drinking. And that only increased our thirst. We were over to the left side of the courtroom in a little, uh, at a little homemade table that evidently had been made out of uh, pine, I guess. It was very splintery. And the first day, you know, you have a tendency to put your arm on the table. And every time I would touch the table, I would get the stick of a splinter and it would pull at the fabric in my dress. So I had to learn to sit away from the table. And uh, the next day we brought newspapers to pad the, the tables with. And uh, as we sat near a window, the, the let's say that the table was going north and south. And at the north end of the table, there was a window and the men had gotten together and planned our escape in case something unfavorable broke out in the in the courtroom, which could well have happened. And they decided that one man would jump out and then the other man would jump out and they would catch us women as we jumped out. There was, I was there and Ruby Hurley was there and our uh, Clotilde, somebody by the name of Clotilde. She was a defender reporter. There were three women and they were going to uh, look out for us and the rest of the men would have to take their chances. Everybody else, you get out the best way you can. Yes, we had an escape plan where, whereby if anything happened in the courtroom that necessitated our getting out in a hurry, uh, two of the men were to leap from the window to the ground and catch the three women, the three of us who were sitting at the black table. And then the rest of the men would have to get out the best way they could. They, they would have to uh, take care of themselves. But it was just, uh, it, it was just amazing how tense that courtroom situation was mm -hmm. that was a you were on the second floor weren't you yes we were so that was kind of a, a weird that, the first men would have to that <laughs> yes the men were going to have to land and then they would catch us but fortunately all of us were very neat in size then mm -hmm. <laughs> Milam and Bryant were portrayed as loving, 
family men uh, devoted to their wives and their children. In fact, each of them had two sons, ranging in age from four to two. And uh, uh, each of them had a child nestled on his knee. And the children were playing with daddy. They were playing with one another. They were hitting. They were just doing things that two and three and four year olds would do. And uh, the fathers were very patient with them. They were listening to see what did they need and how they could satisfy what the kids wanted. That must have been, uh, give me a real close up. That must have been extra galling. I mean, you know, because these are the men who are accused of killing your your son. Yes. There they are with their sons yes. being portrayed as family men. So how yes. did that feel? That didn't feel good. It was, uh, it, it was just such a lie until the the truth leaked out anyway. I mean, you, you knew that these men were not what they were being portrayed to be. And uh, knowing that this was a false uh, opinion that was being reached, I wondered how soon would that veneer crack. I just wondered that. Mm -hmm. But the ironic thing is they took my one son, but both of them lost their two sons. They never saw them grow up. Well, never before in the history of Mississippi had any black man faced a white man and made an accusation against him. This is Mose Wright. I am the author of Emmett Lewis Till. Sunday morning, about 2.30, someone called at the door. And I said, who is it? And he said, this is Mr. Bright. I want to talk with you and the boy. And when I opened the door, there was a man standing with a pistol in, in one hand and a flashlight in the other hand. And he asked me, did I have two boys there from Chicago? I told him I have. And he said, I want it. I want the boy that done all that talk. They marched him to the car and they asked someone there, was this is the right boy? And the answer was, yeah and they drove toward money. That was courage. That was the peak of being courageous. I don't know why Moses Wright felt that he could do this. I certainly don't know why Willie Reed felt he could do it, uh, testify. But uh, they were just like two mice walking into a lion's den when they testified against Milam and Bryant. And to this day, we are wondering what gave them the courage. We know that it had to be the Almighty God because uh, without his help, none of us would have been able to do what we did. What they wanted out of me was uh, proof positive that that was my child. And they would ask me questions and they would even skew these questions so that if I said yes or no, there was doubt. Uh, I might not can remember a direct example, but they alluded to my uh, uh, collaboration with the NAACP and they concluded or they summed up by saying, isn't it true? that you and the NAACP got your heads together and you came down here and with their help, you all dug up a body and you have uh, claimed that body to be your son. Isn't it true that your son is in Detroit, Michigan with his grandfather right now? And his grandfather was there with me. Uh, but they, they just did all kinds of uh, uh, scheming 
to make me out to be a liar and a troublemaker. And uh, then they talked about Emmett's insurance. I had two policies on him. One was a nickel a week, one was a dime a week. The nickel policy would double and bring me a thousand dollars. The dime policy would double and bring me two thousand dollars. And then they wanted to know, did I have Emmett kill so I could collect double indemnity on his insurance? They did everything they could to drag my character down to make me look like an uncaring mother, uh, a schemer, and a money grubber. When the jury retired, uh, I said to my group, I said, it's time for us to go. And uh, 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 Congressman Diggs say what? I missed the verdict? And I looked at him. I was surprised that he didn't know what the verdict was going to be. And uh, I said, Congressman, this is one verdict you don't want to be present to hear. I said, the verdict is not guilty. And he looked at me and he kind of scoffed at me. I mean, after all, this man is a lawyer and he knows uh, the procedure and he has weighed the evidence and he knew that we had to come we had to that they had to come up with a not with a guilty verdict but because i was so agitated for my sake everybody agreed that we would all leave because i was going to leave whether they left or not we were in two separate cars and uh but to appease me, everybody left. We were about out of town about 45 minutes away uh, between Sumner and Mount Bio, Mississippi, where we were staying. And uh, the verdict came in not guilty. And the town erupted. I mean, the screaming, the... Uh, you could hear guns firing. I mean, it was almost like a 4th of July celebration, or it was almost as if the White Sox had won the pennant in the city of Chicago. It was just, uh, it, it was just, oh, it, it was a mess. We were very, very happy that we were 45 minutes away from Sumner because with that verdict came the, uh, additional uh, permission, well, it was, it was really, uh, 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 they gave the okay sign for whites to do, to do in on blacks. And I had seen the black people as the jury retired, the black people who were standing around the walls began to ease out of the door. And I knew that there, that there was a significance to their moving out of the courtroom. And that's when I took my cue that we should leave. But uh, it was open season on Blacks. And I think the Blacks there knew that the farther they were away from town, the better off they would be. So this uh, uh, then we heard reports from the jury, the jury foreman, and his, his comment was, it wouldn't have taken us that long, but they told us to make it look good. So we drank soda water and, and beer and swapped a few jokes, and then we came in with our verdict that took them one hour and seven minutes to find the culprits not guilty. I think the, the Monday that we walked into the courtroom and we could not be seated because of our color. I think that is when my optimism took a downward turn. And as the uh, trial proceeded, and as I watched the antics of the men, their wives, children, and mother, and compared that with the treatment we were uh, getting, 
I knew then that we didn't have a chance. I saw Milam and Bryant, uh, I've seen it on tape, where Milam and Bryant were questioned after the trial and after the verdict had been given. And they were uh, asked, how did they feel or something to that matter? And uh, Roy said, I'm just glad it's over. And when they asked uh, Milam, he repeated what Bryant had said. They were very careful not to give additional information. And they asked the women uh, the same or a similar question, and their responses were very cryptic. And uh, when it got to Juanita Milam, she said, me too. That's all she said. And But they, they were not going to let you see what they felt, whether or not they were afraid, they they were determined not to let that show. After the trial, uh, even though they had been found not guilty, there was still, hope had not died because they had to answer to the kidnapping trial. And they had already admitted that they kidnapped Emmett and that they took Emmett from my uncle's house. And uh, so when the when that trial was convened, uh, we just knew that uh, justice was going to have to be done here. But that trial was thrown out because they were in a different county than where the kidnapping occurred. So that county had no jurisdiction over the case, so they threw it out. Yeah. And Moses Wright and Willie Reed went back to Mississippi for this trial. And uh, uh, now that took uh, a cert that certainly took a lot of courage. They had testified at the trial. They had escaped with their lives. And now they're going back into the lion's den to testify again. And uh, when it was thrown out, it was up to them to get out of Mississippi the best way they could. They had no assistance getting them out. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, Eisenhower was in office and the whole nation had kind of turned to Eisenhower because they thought he was a fair, a fair man. And uh, blacks who had never voted Republican before uh, turned to Eisenhower, helped to vote him in. But when I appealed to the president, the president ended up going, he had a heart attack. He never responded to my telegram. And uh, the next headline I read was they named the hospital he was in. And uh, that was the only response we had from the president was a heart attack. And everybody was concerned about his well-being. And no one was concerned about his giving a hand to help out with the Emmett Till case. No relief whatsoever. I also appealed to J. Edgar Hoover. And he finally responded by saying they had uh, researched the case in its entirety and no federal rules had been violated. And therefore, the federal government had no, there was no way they could enter the case. Well, that is what I am yet waiting to find out. No one has ever told me what happened. Uh, Senator Eastland came out with the uh, story that Lewis had been hung and uh, for rape and murder. Uh, there were people in his battalion who, who wrote to me and talked to me on the phone and talked to Jet Magazine. They said that Lewis Till was railroaded. And they talked about him as being a, a, a giant of a man who was 
always laughing and kidding and playing around, and they could not uh, envision him as being a murderer or a rapist. But Lewis was a, he was a terrific boxer, and he made money with his fist, and he was also a terrific gambler. He lost money with his gambling. That's one of the things that separated us, his not getting home on Friday with money to live on until the next Friday. And uh, uh, Lewis not only was good as a boxer, but he would send me V-mail envelopes with checks in them. I would get three and four a month at $100 a piece. And can you imagine what three or $400 a month meant? when the top wage my stepfather was making was between 24 and $26 a week if he worked overtime. I am certainly not a dependent person uh, the way I was before Emmett was killed. I was completely dependent upon my mother. I looked for her to her for guidance, uh, for to bear my burdens or whatever had to be done. And then all of a sudden I realized that I could no longer depend on mama. It was up to me. And it has made a stronger person out of me. I have been able to look beyond my needs and see other the needs of others. And I think I've been quite a force in uh, working towards those needs and building boys and girls up in their weak spots. I believe that the whole United States is mourning with me. And if the death of my son can mean something to the other unfortunate people all over the world, then for him to have died a hero would mean more to me than for him just to have died. 